Good evening and welcome to Durham Cathedral, the Shrine of St Cuthbert, for this very special service. My name is Michael Everett, I'm the Canon Pastor here at Durham Cathedral and part of my role is to be able to give a warm welcome to the students and staff of Durham University. So it's my tremendous pleasure to welcome you to this service this evening as we gather to give thanks for the birth of Jesus Christ, for God's tremendous gift to us in him. This reading will be taken from John 1, verses 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, 
he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. reading is from Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 to 5. 
Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. reading will be taken from Matthew 1 verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. 
But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The stars are brightly shining It is the night of our dear Saviour's birth Long lay the world in sin and death next reading is from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 to 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. 
from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Hello and welcome. It is such a joy being with you this evening. A huge, huge welcome if you're joining us from Durham and an equally large welcome if you're joining us from further afield. We're probably all thinking it though, aren't we? It's not quite the same, is it? <laughs> We'd usually be crowding into the cathedral, softly lit, and then spilling out and crowding into the DSU or St. Nick's in the marketplace for mince pies and drinks, shoulders rubbing, voices lifting, and laughter filling the air. This is a Christmas none of us expected, a Christmas perhaps none of us wanted. The familiarity which usually marks the season almost feels as though it's been pried away from us through lockdowns and isolations. <laughs> it's usually the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> it's a time of gingerbread houses, eggnog lattes from Starbucks, though they're probably out in April, reindeer antlers, three Christmas dinners a week, winter balls, you name it. It's usually beginning to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> Chestnuts roasting on an open fire as we strain to reach Mariah's operatic heights. And then before we know it, we're driving home for Christmas. Yes, that's right. You see what I did there, don't you? Now, I don't want to sound like too much of a Scrooge, but instead, most of us have been in corridors in college with strangers we don't really want to be with. And perhaps we're feeling just a bit fed up with waiting. <laughs> Here's a story of a, of a family who waited for something special this Christmas. <laughs> I don't suppose you've heard the story of Kevin the Carrot. <laughs> you know the Aldi Christmas advert. I know it's not quite John Lewis, but it just wasn't the same for me this year. If you haven't seen it, it starts with the Carrot family all gathered around the Christmas dinner. But one of them is missing. <laughs> Baby Carrot declares in a small, high-pitched voice, <laughs> It's not Christmas until Daddy gets home. But Daddy, Kevin the Carrot, was a long way from home. Would he spend Christmas all cold and alone? The Carrot family, they're waiting expectantly on the dining room table for Daddy to arrive. Unbeknownst to them, Kevin the Carrot is trying to get back to them through the snow and ice. He hitches a ride from a hedgehog and later on from Santa himself. When he arrives through the cat flap, and he's reunited with his family, there's this glorious slow-mo shot of Kevin the carrot holding baby carrot and just twirling, you know, together in the air. It's, it's beautiful. It really warms the heart. Watch it if you can. It's probably not Kevin the carrot, but I wonder, what are you waiting for this Christmas? The philosopher Raymond Tallis says this about waiting. He says, waiting reflects our helplessness our inability to control the pace as well as the course of events. What are you waiting for this Christmas? What are you looking forward to, longing for that's out of your control? Maybe it's for flat white to reopen in Durham, to go home, or for things to return to normal. It might not be kisses under the mistletoe with a certain someone for you this Christmas, it's not completely COVID secure, but what does your mind keep flitting back to throughout the day? Which destination do you keep tapping into Google Maps just to see how far away it is and how you can get there? What are you waiting for? This is a question that the author of these words and of us all asks of all of us. Even though we're separated by centuries from the original hearers of the words we had so beautifully read out to us, these few sentences lit a spark of hope, a leaning forward in eager expectation of anticipation at the arrival of something, of someone wonderful. These words are a prophecy, 
a promise of someone on their way who is going to change everything. But before we look at the promise, let's zoom in on the condition of the people. The second sentence, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Can you imagine it? Darkness, captivity, slavery, that was the reality for the people hearing these words. A stumbling through an endless mist, far from home. We aren't unlike these people. It's been a dark year for us all, hasn't it? The image of a police officer kneeling on the neck of George Floyd while he's in police custody, handcuffed and struggling for breath, saying that he cannot breathe, is burned into most of our memories. As of last Friday, 1.4 million people across the globe have died from COVID-19. Domestic violence, also referred to by the UN as the shadow pandemic, has increased by 20% with so many at home trapped with their abuser. In the UK, social disparity has been highlighted. Environmental issues, immigration policies, the refugee crisis, the list goes on. Through these events, we have come face to face with our own privilege, colour blindness and systemic racism. Justice issues, be they ethical, legal or social, have been spotlighted in a seemingly unparalleled way this year. I'm sure we can all remember the protests, the pulling down of statues, that deep gut feeling which many of us have carried for centuries, but some of us are only just waking up to, that this is not fair. It should not be like this. And yet, as we move towards rallies or hashtags or no platforming options, it just doesn't seem quite enough, does it? The change never goes deep enough. What real change is this affecting? Because that's what we want. That's what I want. Deep, meaningful, societal justice and change of the darkness. We've tried all sorts of things to do it. You know that odd sentence about boots and warriors and garments rolled in blood? That hints to things that we've tried to do to eradicate the darkness. That fifth sentence, it reads, For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Every boot that has hit the floor in protest, each jacket caught and torn in the marches, each battered eye and each broken neck is not enough. They show us the bleeding realities of injustice, but they haven't been enough to secure justice. The change doesn't go deep enough. And it's not just the darkness out there that burdens us, but it's also the darkness in here within us. And it's also just that messy interrelation of the two. The philosopher Nietzsche, he once wrote that you looked for the heaviest burden you could carry. And it was you that you found. And you will never be rid of you. We are the heaviest burdens. As one person recently said, at times it's amazing the violence people will commit in the name of peace. It's amazing the hate people will show in the name of love. And it's amazing the oppression people will exert in the name of justice. We are all implicated one way or another in this messy matrix. As we try to help, we sometimes end up making it worse. We are all perpetrators of injustice, whether we are aware of it or not. And sometimes, you know, it's just an Amazon click away. That's why privilege is so hard to tackle. The threads, they're woven into our societal structures, and it's not as easy as me cancelling my Amazon Prime account. And so, really, that is the question. In this messy entanglement of me, of you, and of us, what has the power to expel the darkness without destroying us in the process? It's, it's not a what, it's a who. It's not boots but a baby. It's not politics, it's a person. It's not the concept of justice, it is Jesus. On those living in the land of deep darkness, 
a light has dawned. Suddenly, piercing the night, puncturing the darkness, there is a glimmer of light on the horizon. He is the promise, the promise of a child coming into the world who goes through more than snow and ice in order to get to us at Christmas. This is the promise of a child unlike any other, whose justice shines brighter than the sun because justice flows from his very character, his very being. The qualities of this promised person are outstanding. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The kingdom he establishes flows from his very character. And this is a kingdom upheld, we are told in line seven, by justice and righteousness. The need for this kind of kingdom reality spread through a stable, it crossed seas, and it reached the heart of one Terence Floyd. I don't know if you saw it, but George's, George Floyd's brother, Terence, in a rally after his brother's death, called for peace, not violence, to bring about change. Um, after which, after the rally, the crowd began to shout, peace on the left, justice on the right. Reverend McCall, he'd earlier shared these words on behalf of Terence as he was, just, he was just too overwhelmed to be able to share them at the time. And when McCall was asked what Terence meant by peace on the left, justice on the right, McCall said he wanted to make sure you can't get one without the other. It's a very different economy of change. Peace, not violence. Peace on the left, justice on the right. And the need for both peace and justice didn't originate with Terence. They spill out from the very words we had read to us from Isaiah. Indeed, they spill out from the very child to which they point. The government established by God the Father through the Son given to us by the Spirit is one of peace to which there will be no end. It starts to pull on the thread of the fabric of injustice, bringing incredible change now, but complete change later. It is a kingdom upheld and sustained by righteousness and justice. But I wonder what kind of comes into your mind when you hear the word righteousness. You know, you might be thinking sanctimonious, holier than thou, standoffish. Righteousness, however, is more a display of dazzling, virtuous, moral brilliance. There can be no justice without righteousness and no righteousness without justice. We want true justice, not a verdict before which we weep in the pain of how much the system has failed us. This isn't a mere administration of what can be called justice just because it's been served by the judiciary. Righteousness and justice go hand in hand. Without righteousness, we are left with corruption, and without justice, we are left with blind indifference. To just sweep away the events of this year under the rug, to turn a blind eye and to pretend it never happened, is cowardice at best, and it's impotence at worst. The twin pillars of Jesus' kingdom is righteousness and justice, a kingdom in which the least are seen, and the smallest grievance is held to account. The promised person undoes the darkness. And so the promise of a baby whom the people were waiting for has now arrived. As the centuries passed, that spark of promise, that hint of hope that we read in these sentences became a flame, and it's now a roaring fire. As we heard from earlier, the, the reading from the eyewitness taken from of John, that the life of Jesus, his birth, is the anticipated light. The light of his life, which shines in the darkness. What others longed for in eager anticipation has arrived, and he arrived on the world stage 2,000 years ago, born of flesh and blood, and yet so much more. The Prince of Peace came as a baby to establish an everlasting kingdom of peace. Peace.
You know, it's, it's a great word, isn't it? But it doesn't really stretch that far enough. Our English word peace is far too insipid to convey the richness, the texture of the original meaning behind shalom. I hope you don't mind me sharing it with you quickly now. Uh, One theologian pens the distinction between first century Roman peace and Hebrew shalom as this. Peace can be negative, the absence of commotion. Shalom is positive, the presence of serenity. Peace can be partial, shalom is whole. Peace can be piecemeal, shalom is complete. Jesus doesn't just eradicate the darkness. He establishes something in its place. Shalom is not the mere absence of injustice, but it's the presence of serenity, its wholeness, its completeness. It's the dynamic of a home where there's a person who knows your deepest, darkest secrets and yet loves you with a love that blows every other relationship out of the water. A home where you're fully known and fully loved, whole. It's like that feeling, isn't it, of of coming in from the cold and being warmed by a roaring log fire or like slowly slipping into a hot bath. It's a place where you can take off pretense because you're known and loved. You can leave the intensity of turn behind. You can take take off your mask figuratively and literally and breathe. But what's this shalom the shalom rooted in? What actually has the power to bring opposing groups together in flourishing peace and doesn't overlook injustice? It doesn't happen through politics, but a person. The way the early church brought together people from every conceivable background is because they had a vision of life rooted in the prince of shalom, Jesus. He loved the poor and challenged the oppressor. He brought in women, the marginalized, the weak, the sorted, the party animals, the liars and the hypocrites. Who else in history has brought together such diversity? No one but Jesus. It's through peace on the left and justice on the right. But it's not without cost. It costs God the Father something to do this, to establish shalom, cost the person seeking to establish it. And so to us, a son is given. The father gives us the precious gift of his son. And this child goes through more than snow and ice in order to get to us at Christmas. The baby, the God-man, later establishes shalom through the splinters of a cross and the echoing emptiness of the tomb. Jesus dies buried, he was buried and then is raised to life. It costs God and it will cost us if we want to pursue shalom. We are burdened by darkness out there and in here. Who has the power to expel the darkness without destroying us in the process? Could it be this baby? The promise of a baby who the people were waiting for has now arrived and he is waiting for us. He is waiting for you. As Roland Barthes said, to keep others waiting is the ancient prerogative of power. Dysfunctional states and oppressive regimes, they make their citizens wait for goods, for services, for justice. Jesus, unlike every other, unlike any power-hungry dictator, unlike every and very cruel oppressor, unlike every darkened heart, waits not to gain something from you, but is waiting to give something to you. Only love, only Jesus steps down and has paid what we owe. Only he is able to remove and establish what we cannot, to offer to take on our individual and collective burden of darkness and is actually able to do it. Jesus subverts the ancient prerogative of power, not by waiting to gain something from you, but by waiting to give something to you himself. To us, a son is given. We've been given the gift of God himself, the son of the father sent to us, whose life shines like a beacon in the darkness, calling weary wanderers home, the tired, the brokenhearted, the activists home to real life, real change, real community, real justice, real shalom. It's a party to which the host expects you to bring nothing, nothing other than yourself, nothing other than your greatest burden yourself, you. 
so that he can give you the gift of himself. The cross is God's justice, but also it's the gateway to justice in the world both now and forever. This son, Jesus, comes to teach us the goodness of his peace and justice, and one day to wipe away all tears, once and for all. It started now with him. So going through life just changes everything with him. Maybe the more significant question for you this Christmas isn't what are you waiting for, but who might be waiting for you? It's not boots, but a baby. It's not politics, but a person. It's not the concept of justice, it is Jesus. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. And so what will you do with this gift? You know, this might sound like the first few minutes of a familiar Christmas movie, you've seen it so, so many times that you just kind of tune out, please don't. If you open this gift of love, light and life and hope, he will change everything, both now and forever, through peace on the left and justice on the right. This Christmas, why not explore the love and justice of God for yourself, whose justice isn't standoffish but intimate. As the eternal son, Jesus takes on flesh to show us the justice of God, not through condemnation but through his own death, as the only person in history who doesn't look worse when his life is placed under a microscope. And perhaps you have questions on what this justice in Jesus looks like for individuals and societies now, and what this means for the future. Perhaps you'd like to examine the evidence of Jesus' death and and resurrection and and see for yourself. Maybe, maybe you could chat with the person whomever you invited you uh, this evening. You could go for a one-to-one walk with a Christian and a takeaway coster. What an offer. Uh, You could even explore questions together in a small group. But maybe... If you're wondering if this baby can really do it, why not say a few words to Jesus? Ask him to show you the beauty of his being and the light of his life. If you'd like to do this with somebody um, or chat more, there's a prayer Zoom call. There's a prayer line that you can um, call up and dial in afterwards. Don't worry, the cameras are going to be off. Jesus might just be the gift you never expected this Christmas. As you move towards some of these things, I hope that you might meet the one waiting for you, the light who is shining in the darkness. Thank you so, so much for listening. I hope you have a great Christmas. Merry Christmas.
On behalf of all of us at Durham Christian Union, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're thrilled to celebrate and sing carols with you. And we're especially glad to do that here at the end of 2020. I'd especially like to thank Jill Chipchase, the Reverend Canon Michael Everett, the Reverend Canon Michael Hampel, and every one of the incredible cathedral staff and volunteers who made this carol service possible. Thank you also to Durham University Choral Society and Durham University Chamber Choir for beautifully leading us and singing this evening. We're delighted to partner with you every year to host this wonderful service. Sadly, this year, we're unable to invite you to join us for refreshments. However, we warmly invite you to The Search, an opportunity to further explore what Christy has shared with us and the person of Jesus. This year, The Search is being hosted by each of our college Christian unions on Zoom. You can find out more on the Investigating Further page on this Carol Service website. Please take a minute to explore that. Now, this season and term has been one of uncertainty, challenge, and even grief for some of us. In the midst of this holiday season, we would love to pray for you personally. If you'd like to receive prayer, please call the number that we'll share at the end of this stream, and we'll connect you with one of our team. They'll be waiting for a little while after the service to simply listen, pray for you, and bless you. Please take a moment to connect with us if you'd like the prayer or if you'd like to know about who we are as a CU. As I'm sure you're aware, the costs of this service are considerable, and we are really grateful to the cathedral for their generosity and support in letting us use this historic building. We would love to encourage you to give generously to the cathedral to support them and their work in our city and community. One way to do that is through their website. And finally, let me invite you to take a deeper look at the website that has been created specifically for this event. On here, we have a collection of amazing articles that have been written by some fellow students about the history and meaning behind some of the carols and readings that we've heard tonight. I commend these to you wholeheartedly. They are a worthwhile read, and you may even see some familiar names. You'll also find our contact details on the website for you to provide your feedback on the service. We would really love to hear what you have to say uh, about this evening. Um, so do please take a minute to take a look at that. In these extraordinary times, our prayer is that this service will be a reminder of the unshakable hope that Jesus offers each one of us in him. And we pray that you might know him personally. May this season of Christmas be one of peace and joy for all of you. Thank you for a wonderful evening and time of worship and celebration of Jesus. And at this Christmas time, may the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the Magi, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen.